last week it actually outperformed in a weekly basis. I know that's a very small data point, Elijah, but gold was up, I think, 6% or 5 and silver was up like 13 But here we are, you know, several percent in one day. But it will, I still think, and not because of my bias towards silver, which I have, but the uh, dynamics of silver are still so fundamentally strong. And there's so much push for this green movement. And then it's the poor man's gold. And I don't mind using that term because if gold gets at a certain level, there'll be people that want to get into precious metals and they'll look at their just savings account and they'll say, you know, I really, I really want to buy gold. I mean, a lot of them make the statement or the thought process. I want to buy gold. Gold's at 3,000 an ounce now. Silver's only at $30 an ounce. You know what? I want to buy silver. So you get a lot, a lot more for my money. Today, we delve into a comprehensive breakdown of David Morgan's recent video, where he provides expert insights into the gold, silver, and platinum markets. As we navigate through his commentary, we'll unravel the nuances of market dynamics, charting patterns, and the underlying factors shaping the trajectory of these precious metals. In his discourse, David Morgan emphasizes the significance of new highs in commodities like gold, highlighting the bullish sentiment they evoke. With each new high, the anticipation builds, driving further upward momentum. However, he cautions about the inevitability of consolidation periods, where prices may retract before resuming their upward trajectory. Despite the uncertainty inherent in market movements, Morgan remains optimistic about gold's performance, buoyed by sustained buying pressure, particularly from central banks. Drawing from his expertise, Morgan projects a substantial move in gold prices, underpinned by historical trends and current market conditions. He anticipates a continuation of the upward trend, especially as we enter the seasonally strong period for gold. While acknowledging the potential for summer doldrums characterized by decreased market activity, he remains confident in gold's resilience amidst global uncertainties. Turning his attention to silver, Morgan expresses a degree of frustration at its failure to keep pace with gold. Despite occasional outperformance, silver lags behind its counterpart, prompting reflection on its fundamental strengths and market dynamics. However, he remains bullish on silver's long-term prospects citing its utility in the green movement and its appeal as a more affordable alternative to gold. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. The uh, new high, of course, is really great for gold. And um, whenever you get a new high in a commodity or even a stock, I mean, it'll go higher and higher. I've explained many times about you know upward resistance and but it is a new high that's very bullish because everyone says, well, how high is it going to go? So there's not much selling pressure or any new buying pressure pushes it higher. But at some point, there's what's called a, a consolidation or we call it back and filling. These are slang terms that mean that it hits a certain level and then uh, it may fall off and rebuild a base and then move higher. And there's all kinds of charting patterns. You can look at a bull flag, a flagpole. I mean, there's all these terms and a lot of them have uh, high probabilities, but nothing's guaranteed. So, so having said all that, I'm very uh, glad to see gold making new highs. And, uh, and also, some of the mainstream media articles are almost humorous to me, like, we didn't expect this, or how come it's happening, or why is this taking place, and uh, no reason to this, and <laughs> on it goes. And it's simply buying pressure. I mean, there's been so much buying pressure from the central banks, and as I said, if you're unwilling to sell any new buying pressure, you'll push the price higher. So there's gold. I'm glad it's leading. Uh, probably needs to take a breather here. Uh, my forecast in January was we'd see at least a 13% move in gold based on a 13% for 2024, based on the 13% we saw in the 2023. And that you know came in around 2,000-ish, so 10% since 2,000, excuse me, 200. So, you know, 10% is already yet, and we're not in the season, really, the seasonality for gold is the strongest. We'll move into that shortly, and then we're going to go into the summer doldrums, which usually is weak for the metals, but there are times it's not always. It's just a probability. As far as silver is concerned, again, I use the word I used last time, frustrating. I mean, it's not keeping up with gold, and... Last week, it actually outperformed in a weekly basis. I know that's a very small data point, Elijah, but 
gold was up, I think, 6% or 5 and silver was up like 13 But here we are, you know, several percent in one day. But it will, I still think, and not because of my bias towards silver, which I have, but the uh, dynamics of silver are still so fundamentally strong. And there's so much push for this green movement. And then it's the poor man's gold. And I don't mind using that term because if gold gets at a certain level, there'll be people that want to get into precious metals and they'll look at their to savings account and they'll say, you know, I really, I really want to buy gold. I mean, a lot of them make the statement or the thought process. I want to buy gold. Gold's at 3000 an ounce now. Silver's only at $30 an ounce. You know what? I want to buy silver. So you get a lot, a lot more for my money. And that's sort of the penny stock game too. I mean, there's a lot of people that are not very sophisticated in the stock market and really they'd be a lot better off with like one share of, you know, IBM or something rather than 100,000 shares of XYZ mining at 0.01 cent per share. But it makes them feel good having all those shares. They feel good because they own so much. So silver, you could put it in the same place. Those are not a real good analogy, but you get my point <clears throat> that there's a certain trade-off as far as cost goes with the, with the precious metals. And another one, and I'm in it, and I'm very biased now because I have a pretty good position. That's in the platinum market. I mean, platinum really hasn't participated in this move very much, but it's 15 times scarcer than gold and it's half the price. So if it just gets par with gold, which it may not, uh, but if it did, I mean, you'd be buying gold at half price. Something that if you're very sophisticated and want to take added risk, you might look at it. Wholesalers for the most part are, excuse the expression, up to their gills and metal. And in a lot of these you know, bigger outfits use the carry trade. So in other words, they are actually financing the dollars from the bank to buy the metal or buy it back. Let's say, you know, they have to make a two way market. And so they have to borrow it and pick a number 5%. I don't know. It depends. Depends on their credit line. Depends how long they've been in business. And, but it's, but it's a cost. So the longer that the market stays uh, slow on the actual physical retail market, uh, the more carry costs they have to endure. So this uh, motivates them to, you know, try to try, try to mitigate that problem. So yeah, it is unfortunate that it's not, you know, draw, you know, driven by physical demand like it was, you know, early days. I, mean, I don't have time to listen to all of you know Andy Sheckman's interviews, but I remember when the retail market was so hot and the premiums on the Silver Eagles were extraordinarily high, and you know, I was trying to hint, and you know, I'm free market. You want to pay. Uh, you know, $10, $15 premium for a coin that's, you know, $20 or $22. I mean, that's like a 50% premium. I mean, if you want to do it, that doesn't make good logic to me. But regardless, the point I'm making is that that heart, that hot retail side has subsided. And that's not good for the market. There's really, there's several aspects of the silver market, but I try to define it as, the silver market is defined by paper, and the paper contracts are for 1,000 ounce commercial bars. Is the retail silver demand important? You bet it is, but it's really not the best guidance for the silver market. I mean, if you look at guidance on the silver market, you look at the silver bar market, and if the silver retail market is so hot that um, you know more commercial bars are going to the mints because they do. I mean, I've been through the sunshine mint top to bottom, I don't know, three or four times. And, you know, you should use these huge pallets of commercial bars. And what do they do with them? They turn them into one ounce coins. That's what they do. And so, you know, it's, but that's the silver market. I mean, I'm trying to express here is that you can see a very hot retail market and make the mistake that the silver market in total is extremely hot. And that's really not the case. And I try to, you know, I'm not trying to split hairs. I'm just trying to give some calmness and some perspective and a lot of experience to those out there that get hung up on a part of the market, believing that's the total market when it's not. I hope I made sense there because it's important to know and to try to not get too wrapped up or too excited in an aspect of a certain market and then um, maybe make a poor decision. Intriguingly, Morgan highlights the undervaluation of platinum relative to gold, despite its scarcity and industrial applications. 
He posits that platinum's price has yet to fully reflect its intrinsic value, presenting a compelling investment opportunity for those attuned to market disparities. Beyond the surface-level analysis, Morgan delves into the intricacies of the precious metals market, distinguishing between retail and commercial demand. He underscores the importance of understanding these dynamics to avoid misinterpretations and ill-informed decisions. While acknowledging the role of paper contracts in shaping market sentiment, he emphasizes the enduring relevance of physical demand, particularly in uncertain economic climates. Yeah, I see it higher, higher, and higher. So let me say it uh, higher, lower, higher, meaning I probably, we will probably will see the silver, silver and gold doldrums in the summertime where there's, uh, you know, not much interest in the metals markets. Again, it could, that's a probability. It's a high probability, not guaranteed. But there's so much going on, it's status quo. If nothing changes from where it is now, you're borrowing, you know, a trillion dollars at the clip that the U.S. is borrowing at. Your, you know, the war f situation's no better or no worse. The um, geopolitical infighting between people that are coming to the fore that are populist versus people that are more uh, authoritarian. I mean, everything that's as it is now doesn't change. It just remains the same. You're going to see higher prices. There's just too much going on in these markets that give people the uncertainty of what is their currency going to be worth in the future. And especially if you go into the third world where you look at, you know, Vietnam or, I mean, Vietnam is uh, not a really good example as far as uh, population size, but they are looking at food prices that are going up at such a, a large clip that they do spend basically whatever they make, you know, that week. I mean, it's pushing toward a hyperinflationary environment. And that's not just Vietnam. There are other smaller countries in the world that have faced that problem. So in those countries, you know, they don't know the difference between the silver market and the silver retail market. They don't care. All they care about is that's a way to protect themselves. And so they may pay a high premium and not worry about it too much because in their currency, you know, it's going to be higher no matter what. And that's kind of the situation that we as precious metals investors have to our advantage. Not that I'm pro-inflation, I'm dead set against inflation. But the idea is that this time it'll be a global market. So it'll be more than just a United States inflation problem. It'll be a global problem. And is inflation under control? Well, of course, the Fed's going to say it. But in reality, it isn't. And that's why they keep delaying these interest rate uh, cuts. Against the backdrop of geopolitical tensions and economic uncertainties, Morgan offers a sobering assessment of the prevailing macroeconomic conditions. He warns of the inflationary pressures brewing globally, fueled by excessive borrowing and geopolitical instabilities. While acknowledging the inevitability of systemic shifts, he remains cautious about the potential implications for fiat currencies and the broader financial system. As we navigate these turbulent times, Morgan encourages vigilance and resilience in the face of evolving market dynamics. He advocates for a nuanced understanding of the underlying forces driving precious metal prices, tempered by a recognition of broader economic realities. In closing, he invokes a sense of collective responsibility in safeguarding financial freedoms and advocating for transparency in monetary systems. And once the interest rate cuts take place, the signal to those that understand how money works, how the global cash flows operate, and what the U.S. is really signaling, they're throwing in the white towel and they're saying, we're done. We are going to cut interest rates and we don't care what happens to the dollar anymore. And that's a cue for it to be inflated away into a hyperinflationary environment. Will that happen? Absolutely not. Or I'll say absolutely not. I'll be that bold because there'll be a new system right around the corner. So when these currencies fail, they fail, but then they reset and restart. And they have it usually gold backed. I don't think they'll attempt a gold backed digital currency initially. I think they'll try just to push over the system into a new realm where you exchange old old for new and there's no cash and you go into a, a computer form or digital form only and you got to get verified that you're you and uh, who knows what's going to go on. It's been cited by many people other than myself, but it'll probably be more Orwellian than you care to imagine. So the dollar won't be worth zero. It'll be worth, you know, 0.07 cents. Who knows what I'll get to, but it will be an excuse for it to be... Um, 
a new system. And that's what, you know, especially the Christian community among others. I mean, you're not be a Christian, but I mean, the Christian community certainly has looked at this for years as far as the mark of the beast and what does it look like and what are we going to have to do and how will we know and all those questions that come to the fore as we're getting near the end of this great Keynesian experiment that always fails. So I probably went on too far, but I'll tell you, it's a point in time that's very extremely interesting to live in. And also people like you and I that have basically raised our voices against the uh, tyranny to say, look, you know, people, people really get to decide what money is. People need to be free. And if you have a system that dictates everything you think, do and say, and you're scared to speak the truth, then you're in very interesting times. And to do my favorite quote, speaking the truth in times of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. So thanks for being with the revolution for so long. Elijah, I appreciate it.